subject of contending for the faith and defending the truth of the gospel. And that was about February of 2011. And some of the things that I discovered as I was researching in that subject, I was discussing them with Morris shortly after that, and just in a general conversation that we had. And a few weeks after that, Morris phoned me, and he asked me, would I come and deal with this subject? Uh, the subject is, the title is Purpose Driven Lies, or The Purpose Driven Lie. And over the past few months, as Morris has said, there's been a, a few months of study have gone into this, a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I've had my eyes opened, been able to spend a lot of time in God's Word and preparing for this message. And there have been times in those months when I wished I'd never had that conversation with Morris, because it's a, it is a difficult issue to deal with. But God's good. God's Word is truth. And we're going to look at it, and we're going to try and deal with it from God's Word. So Galatians chapter 1 and the verse 1. And God's Word says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by, ma by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed or anathema. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Amen. And we know God will bless this reading of his word to our hearts this evening. As I've said, this message, I suppose this study, and the subject I'm dealing with tonight came out of another message that I dealt with at the start of last year. And as part of that study that I was carrying out then, in early 2011, I was, I was led and I was drawn to consider the growing, the growing influence within the church, I suppose at large, of many who I believe can only be described as false teachers. And I firmly believe that the, the popularity and the proliferation of these teachers is greatly assisted by the fact that there are so many today, even within the church, there are so many who want a God who is accessible to them on their terms. They want a God who meets their felt needs. They want a God who boosts their self-esteem. And it's all about them. And that is why people, for example, people like Joel Osteen is so popular. Joel Osteen preaches a light gospel. You can watch him on YouTube, on YouTube clips where he has publicly, in radio or in television interview, refused to state that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. <coughs> Says that I can't say to someone else that their road might not be the right road for them. In that same interview, he says that he doesn't use the word sin because he won't go down the road of condemning anyone with the word sin. And yet the word sin appears in God's word over 830 times. But Joel Austin won't use it because he doesn't want to condemn anyone. You see, the message is being twisted around and it's being twisted around so that it's all about positivity and it's all about the listener. It's all about the seeker and it's not about God's word. Joel Austin has written a book. It's a self-help manual, but it's labeled as, a Christian literature, as Christian literature. The book is entitled Your Best Life Now and it's sold over five million copies as Christian literature. And this is a man who refuses to use the word sin. This is a man who refuses to say that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. But you know, there's so many others of the same ilk as Joel Austin. There's others, for example, Benny Hinn, Joyce Mayer, Creflo Dollar, all of these people that you see on these religious channels. And they have these great uh, events all across the world. 
God's Word says in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be, they shall be turned to fables. All of these teachers, for want of a better phrase. But you know, the teacher that I want us to consider this evening is, in my opinion, the one who causes the most concern in evangelical circles today. And that individual is Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church. Saddleback Church in the United States of America, it's the eighth largest church in America. It's the largest church in the Southern Baptist movement. And Rick Warren has written the best-selling, and it tells it on the front cover of the book, the best-selling non-fiction hardback book in history, The Purpose Driven Life. Over 30 million copies of it were sold by the start of 2011, and that copy there is a reprint, a 2011 copy. So up until that point, 30 million copies of that book had been sold worldwide as Christian literature. So what are the problems with Rick Warren? What are the problems with the message of Rick Warren? Well, in my opinion, and in comparing Rick Warren's writings and Rick Warren's words with God's Word, there are many issues and many problems. But before we go into those, I don't want this to be seen as completely a negative critique. I want to highlight two practical positives that Rick Warren has hit upon, and I emphasize the words hit upon in his book. The first thing is the opening question. The opening question in the book says, what on earth am I here for? What on earth am I here for? And you and every person who's a child of God should ask themselves that question in light of our service for our Master. What on earth am I here for? I remember when I was much younger, I was taught the shorter catechism. And the first question, I don't remember much of the rest of it, if I was asked the questions I might be able to have a stab at some of them, but the first question always stuck with me. And the first question is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Over in 1 Corinthians, and the chapter 10, and the verse 31, God's Word says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Our responsibility as Christians, when we ask ourselves that question, what on earth am I here for? Well, I'm here to glorify God. I'm here for God's glory. You're here for God's glory if you're a child of God this evening. So let's recognize that opening question is a question that we should ask. There's another thing or a couple of other things that I could say are positives. He emphasizes some positive aspects of the Christian life in his book. For example, he references what he calls Scripture 1,200 times in the book. Reading Scripture, trying to build your life upon Scripture, well, that's important. Now, he emphasizes reading Scripture, but we're going to look at what Rick Warren means when he talks about reading Scripture later on. A devotional life. He talks about having a devotional life. And yes, that's important it's incredibly important for us as Christians to have a devotional life, a life which is devoted to God, a time when we can spend time with God, the one who saved us. He talks about witnessing to others on day 37 of the 40-day program. And again, that's important. We're to witness to others. We're to tell others about our Savior. We're to tell others about Jesus, the mighty to save. That's important. So let's acknowledge those things when attempting to carry out an assessment of this book. But the problem really comes in when we start to assess the negative aspects of this book. Because the negative aspects of the book will lead us in turn to investigate the actions and the words of the author. Now, as well as that, just in, by way of introduction, before anyone questions the motive for this type of analysis of, of a book and of this individual, it is consistent with Scripture to do so. It is consistent with Scripture to do this. In Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, the writer of the book of the Acts takes time to acknowledge and to commend those in the synagogue in Berea 
And he commends them for not only receiving the word, but cross-checking the word with Scripture to determine if it is an authentic message or not. And that's what we ought to do as Christians. We ought to adopt that Berean attitude. We ought to adopt that attitude whereby we check everything that's presented against God's Word to determine whether it is edifying for us as children of God, to determine whether it is of God's Word or not. We ought to adopt that practice in our lives, each and every one of us. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Ephesus in the chapter 4, beseech the the believers in that chapter 4 and verse 1. He said to them, Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Walk worthy. And then verse 14 of that chapter, when we get further on down, he says, That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Be no more children. Now, I'm conscious tonight that I'm in a, a youth rally. I'm conscious tonight that there, there's many as a one here and you're in that stage in your life where you're having to get involved in God's work. You're at that level in your life, at that age in your life, where people are asking you to get involved. Well, let me say something. Walk worthy. If you're a child of God, walk worthy of whatever service you do for the Master. And don't be tossed to and fro. Be no more children. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Make sure you know what you believe. And the only way you're going to know that is to get into this book. Don't worry about Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. Don't be worrying about any other self-help manuals. Get into this book. This is God's Word. His Word is truth. And there's a number of areas I want us to consider this evening, and I'm, I'm also conscious of time. I want to try and keep this as brief as I can, but there's an awful lot in it. I am going to try and keep it short. I'll not keep you long, or very long. There's a number of areas this evening. There's four main areas. The first one I believe I have titled a defective gospel. A defective gospel. The second one is a deficient approach to Scripture. The third one is a dysfunctional spiritual family, and the fourth one is a distinct New Age flavor. A defective gospel, a deficient approach to Scripture, a dysfunctional spiritual family, and a distinct New Age flavor. So let's look at the first one, a defective gospel. A defective gospel. Gary Gilley, author of a book by the name of This Little Church Went to Market, wrote this in his chapter about Rick Warren. He wrote a, a, a chapter in that book entitled The Gospel According to Warren. And I would encourage anybody, anybody here who's interested in these things to read Gary Gilley's book. He's written a couple of books uh, along that same theme. There's This Little Church Went to Market and there's a couple of other books in the same theme. But he wrote a book, he wrote this chapter entitled The Gospel According to Warren. And he wrote in it, he said, he will tell, speaking about Rick Warren, he will tell his followers that he is not tampering with the message, but only re-engineering the methods, when in fact he has so altered the message as to make it almost all but unrecognizable. He has so altered the message as to make it all but unrecognizable. Now, why would Gary Gilley, who's a fairly popular Christian author, make a statement containing such an indictment of altering the gospel message? Why would he do that? Well, let's take some time to consider Rick Warren's definition of the gospel in his own words. This is the prayer which Rick Warren used on the accompanying video to his 40 Days of Purpose campaign, which was held in his own church. This is the prayer, the sinner's prayer. Dear God, I want to know your purpose for my life. I don't want to base the rest of my life on wrong things. I want to take the first step in preparing for eternity by getting to know you. Jesus Christ, I don't understand how, but as much as I know how, I want to open my life to you. Make yourself real to me and use this series in my life to help me know what you made me for. End of prayer. Now, I find it difficult in light of studying God's word to see this as a biblical presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no recognition of sin 
There's no repentance. There's no faith in Christ. He makes mention of the name Jesus Christ, but he just says, I don't understand how. But as much as I know how, I want to open my life to you. There's no faith in Christ. That prayer is really just a string of generic sentences about finding purpose in life. It starts off with, I want to know your purpose, and it finishes off with, use this series, the 40 Days of Purpose series, in my life to help me know what you made me for. That's not the gospel, folks. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know, maybe the purpose-driven life will do better in its gospel presentation. Just for the sake of background, this book was first published in 2002. As I've said already, it's sold, at the start of 2011, it has sold over 30 million copies. It's the most popular Christian literature of all time outside of the Bible. And those aren't my words, those are the words of Rick Warren. It was reprinted in 2011, and the only change is that it has added in these QR codes, which I'm too old to understand what you do with them. There's QR codes for each of the 40 days, and you can click on the QR code and get a a link to a three-minute video from Rick Warren on each of those 40 days. That's the only difference. On this book, page 37, day four, Warren says this. If you learn to love and trust God's son, Jesus, you will be invited to spend the rest of eternity with him. On the other hand, if you reject his love, you will spend eternity apart from God forever. That almost, almost gets there. Almost sounds acceptable, but it's not the gospel. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. How can an unsaved person learn to love and trust someone that they don't know? The Lord Jesus Christ. How can that be the case? As Gary Gilley rightly points out, these are fruits of regeneration. These are not the means of regeneration. In Acts 17 and verse 30, the Apostle Paul is speaking on Mars Hill. And he tells the people at Mars Hill, he says, that God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. To repent. In Mark chapter 6, the Lord Jesus Christ sent the disciples out to preach. And you'll recall that he sent them out in pairs. And he sent them out and told them not to take all these different things with them. He just sent them out to preach. And in verse 12 of Mark chapter 6, God's word says, And they went out and preached that men should repent. Repentance. They preached that men should repent. The Greek word metanio, to repent, in in these verses and in God's word, is defined by F.F. Bruce, as involving a turning with contrition from sin to God. The repentant sinner is in the proper condition to accept the divine forgiveness. Repent. I don't see repentance in what Rick Warren is saying here. And then the only other occasion when he really gets close is on page 58, day 7 of The Purpose Driven Life. And he says this, He says, real life begins by committing yourself completely to Jesus Christ. If you're not sure you have done this, all you need to do is receive and believe. Will you accept God's offer? First, believe. Believe God loves you and made you for his purpose. Believe you're not an accident. Believe you were made to last forever. Believe God has chosen you to have a relationship with Jesus who died on the cross. And there he gets the cross. That's the first time he mentions the cross who died on the cross for you. Believe that no matter what you've done, God wants to forgive you. Second, receive. Receive Jesus into your life as Lord and Savior. He's getting close here. Receive his forgiveness for your sins. He's almost there. Receive his Spirit, who will give you the power to fulfill your life purpose. It's all about you. Rick Warren's first words in this book are... It's not. This book is not about you. And then, to quote one commentator who I read, and I can't remember his name, he said he then proceeds to write a book which is all about you. It's all about what you can get. It's not about a God who is holy. It's not about a God who we're separated from because of our sin. It's all about you and fulfilling your life purpose. Warren then quotes 
the message, the message paraphrase, I'm not going to call it a Bible because it's so far removed from a Bible. John 3 and verse 36 in the message says, Whoever accepts and trusts the Son gets in on everything, life complete and forever. And then Warren comes to what he describes as a prayer that will change your eternity. Jesus, I believe in you and I receive you. Amen. That's it. That's the gospel. The gospel according to Rick Warren. And then on the basis of repeating those words, Rick Warren says, if you have just repeated those words, welcome to the family of God. How dare Rick Warren even presume to know? Does Rick Warren know the hearts of the people? who are reading his book. Jesus, I believe in you and I receive you and that's it. You're in the family. This watered-down, seeker-sensitive presentation of the gospel again mentions nothing about why Jesus Christ came to earth. It doesn't mention why he went to the cross. It doesn't mention why Christ went to Calvary. It makes no mention about the shedding of the precious blood of Christ to pay the price, to pay the penalty. It doesn't make any mention about the wrath of God poured out upon His Son for our sins. It is no suggestion of repentance. There's no suggestion of confession. There's no mention of man's sinful nature. This is easy believism. John MacArthur, referring to this non-gospel, said, no repentance, no judgment, no hell, no heaven. No self-denial, no discussion of sin, no laying down of the law of God against which the sinner is broken, no sense of guilt, no sense of condemnation, no fear of eternal torment. This is an inadequate gospel. And I agree with him. I agree with him. T.A. McMahon, then I read what he said about the book, and he refers to Warren's use of the, the message paraphrase for John 3 and 36, and he pointed out that the interpretation used And we're going to come to his interpretations, the way he interprets Scripture and what interpretations he uses and what translations he uses later on. But the interpretation used makes an obvious appeal to the flesh. Furthermore, it leaves out the negative remainder of the verse. You see, John 3 and 36 doesn't stop halfway. John 3 and 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, why would Rick Warren leave that out? Because it's negative. There's a negative connotation to it. And this is all about being positive. This is all about presenting a positive message. And we're going to come to the positive possibility thinking at at a later stage. God's Word in Romans 5 and 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8 For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That word faith is so much more than simply believing something to be the case. Strong's Concordance defines it as a firm persuasion or a conviction. And it is always used in the New Testament of faith in God or faith in Christ. Now that is a whole lot more than learning to love and trust. We have to have that firm persuasion that conviction of our need to have peace with God. I believe the gospel, as outlined by Rick Warren, is seeker-sensitive and it's deficient. It's a defective gospel. In May 2011, Rick Warren was asked by John Piper in an interview about the presentation of the gospel in Purpose Driven Life. And Rick Warren's response was, and this is a direct quote, if I had known how many unbelievers were going to read it, I would have explained salvation far much more in detail. Well, that's good, Rick. But you know what? He had nine years to get it right. And nine years later, he printed this. Not one word of a difference. And on the back cover of this book, printed in 2011, it says, available for the first time, all the wisdom of the original. Not changed at all. Not one change apart from the QR codes. And before I finish this point, I want to give one more quote from Rick Warren. He said, It is my deep conviction that anybody can be won to Christ if you discover the key to his or her heart. 
It may take some time to identify it, but the most likely place to start is with the person's felt needs. That's just a seeker-sensitive pop psychology nonsense. That's all that is. Nonsense. I refer back to Mark chapter 6, when Christ sent out the disciples. When Christ sent out the disciples and they preached that men should repent, do you think the disciples went out first of all and carried out a survey in the area and asked people, what are your felt needs? What do you think you need to boost your self-esteem? Of course they didn't. They went out and they told people on the authority of the one who sent them, you're a sinner and your sin separates you from God and you need to turn to him. You need to repent. They didn't identify people's felt needs. You see, they knew on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ that man's greatest problem, man's greatest need is salvation. Man's greatest problem is the sin that separates him from God. Folks, we, we have a holy God and he cannot look, he cannot countenance our sin. It's not about our felt needs. It's not about how we feel. It's not about our self-esteem. It's about being right with the Holy One of Heaven. The one who Jesus Christ himself described in his prayer as Holy Father. That's the one that we have to worry about. That's who we ought to concern ourselves with. The disciples preached that men should repent. And you can't preach repentance unless you first tell them that they need to repent from something. Show people the depth of their sin. Show them what Christ has done for them in his death and in his resurrection. And call on them to come to Christ, confessing their sin and seeking his forgiveness. That's what they need. There's a defective gospel. Secondly, there's a deficient use of Scripture. Now, when I looked at this issue, it was difficult to know where to start because there were so many issues and so many problems that presented themselves. One commentator expressed the view that there were at least 42 biblical inaccuracies and 18 passages taken out of context and a significant number of distorted translations. And over the past number of months, I have read a lot of analysis on this book from different writers. I've read an awful lot of critiques and every, almost every critique which I have read on this book has highlighted the same problem. Warren seems to take scripture and make it fit his point rather than the other way around. You see, whenever we study God's word and when we're preparing a message, when we're getting into God's word, whatever it might be in your quiet time, we're not looking for scripture to fit our point. We're looking for scripture to speak to us. Warren takes scripture and makes it fit his point. There's no exposition of the word. There's no exegesis applied. There's no context applied. He just lifts verses out of context and applies them willy-nilly to fit his point. And he takes whatever translation suits his point. Nathan Bessenitz wrote a chapter on evaluating the claims of the purpose-driven life and in that chapter, he stated that with no less than 15 different Bible translations and paraphrases, Warren offers proof text for much of his discussion, usually without any exegetical or contextual support. Warren defends his use of proof texting in the Purpose Driven Life. At the back of the book, it gives a list of all the different translations and paraphrases that he used. And at, at the start of that, Page 325 of the book, he stated this. He said, The model for this is Jesus and how he and the apostles quoted the Old Testament. They often just quoted a phrase to make a point. And on the basis of that, Warren believes that he can take whatever translation he wants and he can lift it out of context as much as he wants and he can misapply it in whatever way he chooses. And that's what he does. I have a question. On each and every occasion when the Lord Jesus Christ or an apostle took an Old Testament verse and applied it, they were under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. 
And they were able to do that because they were inspired by the Spirit of God. This does not give Rick Warren or any other preacher the right to misapply Scripture to fit a point. It doesn't give me the right. It doesn't give anyone the right to misapply Scripture. Another author, Warren Smith, wrote a book about this purpose-driven life called Deceived on Purpose. And he makes a point about how Warren misapplies Scripture and how his misapplication of Scripture is ill-advised. He refers to day three of the purpose-driven life, page 30, where Warren partially quotes Isaiah 49 and verse 4. And he quotes it on this occasion from the, the New International Version. And it says there, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Warren misuses this verse to argue that the prophet Isaiah was expressing hopelessness and that his life had no meaning. He's suggesting that Isaiah had a meaningless life and he was living a hopeless life. And yet when this verse is read in its entirety and in context, we see that the meaning is so different from what Warren makes it to be or perhaps what Warren needed it to be in order to fit his point. Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 4, read like this. Listen, O eyes, unto me, and hearken, ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain, and have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet, surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. Warren leaves off that last part of the verse. He also leaves off the verses earlier on in the passage. But when you put it all together and you put it in the context of what it's supposed to be, it shows that Isaiah was very aware that he was in God's hands, that his life had purpose, his life had meaning. He acknowledges that in the second half of verse 4, the bit that Warren conveniently forgets to quote. How dare Rick Warren misapply Scripture so outrageously? And in doing so, cast a shadow over the character of God's prophet Isaiah. Because that's what he does. He says that Isaiah was living a life of mean, uh, which was meaningless and which was hopeless. He does the same thing in the same chapter, in fact in the same paragraph with Job. And on this occasion, he quotes two verses from Job chapter 7, verse 6 and verse 16. Verse 6 he quotes from the Living Bible, verse 16 he quotes from today's English version. And these are both in the same sentence in the, in the book, in Warren's book. So, so far, he's quoted the NIV, and then he's moved into the next, very next sentence, and he's quoted the Living Bible, and then in the very next phrase of the sentence, he's quoted the, or today's English version, and then further on down, he gets to another translation, all to make one point in one or two paragraphs. He says that Job was living a hopeless life and expressed hopelessness. Now, Job was in the midst of a time of great loss and sorrow, and we understand that. Everything essentially in life had been taken from him, and he was suffering but at the very onset of all this torment and all this trouble, Job's wife had said to him, curse God and die. And what was Job's response? Job chapter 2 and verse 10. Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. It also said in chapter 1 verse 21, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job was not in a hopeless state. He knew that everything in his life was in God's hands. He understood that. Rick Warren might say it was a meaningless life. But God's word proves differently. Job 19, verses 25 and 26. Job was responding to one of his friends who had come to speak to him, Bildad. And Job said this, and I love these words, for I know that my Redeemer liveth. This was Job looking forward. I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and know after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Sounds hopeless, doesn't it? Sounds meaningless. What hope Job had. But then just as supposed to add insult to injury, in his very next paragraph, Warren quotes a man by the name of Dr. Bernie Siegel. Bernie Siegel is a New Age leader from the New Age movement. He claims 
a spirit guide called George. And George, he says, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story about George. I was telling Morris this during the week on the phone, and if I told you, you would really be laughing, and I don't want to be going down that road because I'll get distracted. But I uh, got distracted. Bernie Siegel said that, and I quote this from Bernie Siegel, he said, George made my life much easier now because he does all the hard work. Spirit guide, demon guide. Warren Smith, himself converted to Christ out of the New Age movement, states that Siegel is a leading New Age author and spokesperson. And this is the man that Rick Warren directs the people to who are reading his book to prove his argument about hope. A New Age guru who believes in encouraging people to do guided meditations in order that they can make contact with their own personal spirit guides or demon guides. Gary Gilley highlights another verse which Warren had taken from the Old Testament and misapplied in the same chapter of the Purpose Driven Life. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. And this time Warren uses a New Century version. That's four different translations so far in the space of about three or four paragraphs. And this time it says, I know what I'm planning for you. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I will give you hope and a good future. The King James Version reads, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Warren uses this verse to claim, and this is his claim, if you have felt hopeless, hold on. Wonderful changes are going to happen in your life as you begin to live it on purpose. It does not just sound fantastic. Wonderful changes are going to happen in your life as you begin to live it on purpose. It sounds wonderful, except for one fact. As Gary Gilley points out, this is a promise to Israel concerning their future. It is not a general promise for all people at all times. And further on in Jeremiah, the Lord reverses the promise. In Jeremiah 44 and verse 27, the Lord says, Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. I don't see Rick Warren quoting this verse. I don't see him saying, you're going to have a great time for a while, but then the Lord's going to turn it all over. Warren's use of 15 different translations also undermines an accurate statement that he does make in his book. On day 24, the chapter is titled, Transformed by Truth. And in that book, Warren makes a statement, the Bible must always have the first and last word in life. In my life, he says. But the general principle is the Bible must always have the first and last word in your life, in my life. That is, generally speaking, a good statement. The Bible must have first place and last place in your life. But in that chapter of the book alone, Warren quotes from eight different translations to make his point. And he misapplies a number of verses in that chapter. Throughout the book, he continually uses whichever translation or paraphrase best suits his particular and his given point at that time. On the basis of what Warren is teaching people to do in the book, any professing Christian can go from translation to paraphrase to translation to paraphrase to whatever you want to use, looking for affirmation of pretty much anything you want. Because you can just go to whichever translation you can get your hands on and you can look it up until you find something that fits what you want it to fit. Because that's what Warren does time and time and time again. Young people, I want to say to you, this is not a model for reading or studying God's Word. And don't get this into your heads that it is a model that you can jump from translation to translation to translation. You will not be rooted in God's Word if you float around. If you go from this one to this one to this one looking for what you want out of it, you will never be rooted and grounded properly in the Word of God. Now, I know you've had... uh, Kenny Wilson was here last year and he dealt with uh, the King James Version. And I'm not going to get into that argument or that debate tonight. Um, I support what he said. I use the King James Version and I would recommend that translation to each and every one. That's what I'm going to say about it. But don't go down the road of jumping from translation to translation 
to translation. But Rick Warren appears to heavily favor the new translations. He likes the message, which isn't really a Bible translation. It's more like a paraphrase. He likes the living Bible, it appears to be, because he uses them regularly. The message contains the following phrase in its rendering of the Lord's Prayer. It uses the phrase, as above, so below, in place of, in earth, as it is in heaven. Now, the New Age Journal, referring to that phrase, as above, so below, as below, so above, states this. The max, this maxim implies that the transcendent God beyond the physical and the immanent God within ourselves are one. This phrase is widely used in the occult, and it essentially promotes the New Age belief that God is in everyone and everything. That's what it promotes. Now, why use that phrase with such dangerous connotations? Why would it be used? And yet, the same paraphrase translation that it comes from the message, on day one of the Purpose Driven Life program, the first scripture verse quoted is Colossians 1 verse 16 from the message. And it reads like this. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. We have that same phrase again. That same phrase. The King James Version much more accurately renders this verse. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth. What's wrong with using the words heaven and earth? What's wrong with that? Call it what it is that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Why use a translation or a paraphrase translation such as this? with these clearly dangerous occultic phrases in them. There's clearly deficient use of Scripture by Rick Warren. The Apostle Paul in his charge to Timothy said in Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 and 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. When you're reading God's Word, that's what you need to be looking for. You need to be looking to be taught in your doctrine. You need God to speak to you sometimes in reproof and correction. You need instruction in righteousness. That's what Scripture's for. It's not just so that you can find something to justify something that you want to do. That's not what Scripture's for. That's a deficient use of Scripture. And then we move on to dysfunctional spiritual family. A dysfunctional spiritual family. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 the Apostle Paul is encouraging the believers in the church at Corinth as they labor in their ministry for the Lord. And in verses 14 through to 18, Paul instructs them not to be yoked or to be working together with unbelievers. He tells them there should be no fellowship with those who are following after false gods. And in verse 17, he tells them to be separate. And that literally means to mark off by boundaries or limits. Mark it off by boundaries or limits. Fortunately, Rick Warren appears by his actions to have set this aside. He would probably argue that that was not the case. He would probably argue that he had been separate and he was keeping himself separate. But then Rick Warren has developed a bit of a reputation for saying what his specific audience wants him to hear. One example of this is from June 2006 when he gave a speech at Synagogue 3000 specifically to Jewish leaders. Rob Eshman, the editor-in-chief of the Jewish Journal, reported that, now bear in mind that Rick Warren is a professing Christian pastor. He's, he's unofficially titled America's pastor. He's deemed to be the leading light in evangelical Christianity. Warren managed to speak for the entire evening without once mentioning Jesus. A testament to his savvy message tailoring. Warren says what needs to be said to suit his audience. Well, what about the prayer which he gave at the inauguration of Barack Obama as President of the United States of America? Now, this is, a, this is crafted. Rick Warren is an incredibly intelligent man to craft something like this. 
Newsweek.com commented that Warren has learnt some important lessons about rhetorical caution because his prayer aimed to be inclusive. He started off with God. He, he prayed, he said, Our Father, and went on to proclaim that everything we see and everything we can't see exists because of you alone. That's fine. So far, so good. Newsweek then goes on to state that in a deft... Now, bear in mind that this is a secular, magazine, a secular uh, news magazine. In a deft and fluid nod to the three great monotheisms, he quoted the Shema, the most important prayer in Judaism, which goes like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. In the next phrase, he praised God as compassionate and merciful. Those are the words which religious Muslims encamp regularly as they pray. And he then spoke of God as loving to everyone, which Newsweek took as a reference to John 3 and 16. Those words, the compassionate and merciful one, open all but one chapter of the Quran. Spoke to the Jews. Spoke to the Muslims. And then gave a nod to evangelical Christianity. Did we notice it? Did we notice it? Then Warren went on to pray in the name of Yeshua, Isa, Jesus, Jesus. Now, Jesus is obviously the, the Spanish uh, name, version of Jesus. So he went on to pray in the name of Yeshua, Isa, Jesus. Again, giving a nod in the direction of Islam and Judaism. Because Isa is the name in the Quran which is used for the prophet Jesus. And Yeshua is the, the Jewish name for Jesus. This was a well-crafted prayer designed to keep everybody happy. He will say what needs to be said in order to suit the moment. Now, why would I talk about a dysfunctional spiritual family? Well, dysfunctional is described as a dictionary definition is as not performing normally or behaving or acting outside the norm. And that's what Rick Warren has been doing with some of his associations with those outside of evangelical Christian circles. So let's look at some of those relationships now. First one, the first person I want to mention is Robert Schuller. Robert Schuller is the senior minister of the Crystal Cathedral in America. He's been called the father of the dreamer movement. He encourages people by, with this thought, you know, that if you can dream it, if you can think it, you can do it. It's positive. It's just positive possibility thinking. Bruce Wilkinson, author of both The Prayer of Jabez and The Dream Giver, on the platform of Schuller's Church on the 26th of October 2003 said this. He said, I want to talk about dreams. Of all places in the world to talk about dreams, this is the place because I think Dr. Schuller is the patriarch, the father figure in the work about living your dream. Rick Warren calls Bruce Wilkinson one of his closest friends in the world. Now let's look at what Robert Schuller has said. We haven't linked the two together yet, but we're going to. Let's look at what Robert Schuller has said. Robert Schuller said, I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ and under the banner of Christianity, which has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelism enterprise than the, listen to this, often crude, uncouth, and unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. Now, notice that he doesn't deny that men and women, and that is our condition outside of Christ, that we're lost and sinful. He doesn't deny it. He's simply saying that attempting to make people aware of that is crude, uncouth, and unchristian. Don't tell people they're sinners. Even if they are, don't tell them. It's too negative a message. In his book, Self-Esteem, The New Reformation, Schuller said the church's problem is that it has had a God-centered theology for centuries when it needs a man-centered one. He also went on and said, we're not bad, merely badly informed about how good we are. And then this one on his live television broadcast, Hour of Power, on the 9th of November, 2003, yes, God is alive and he is in every single human being. Oneness. And we're going to talk about that very shortly. Now, Rick Warren has denied that he has been mentored or influenced in any way by Robert Schuller. But Christianity Today magazine in 2002 carried this report. 
Incidentally, the year that Purpose Driven Life was first published. During his last year in seminary, Rick and Kay Warren drove west to visit Robert Schuller's Institute for Church Growth. We had a very stony ride out to the conference, says Kay Warren, because such non-traditional ministry scared her to death. Schuller, though, won them over. These are the words of Rick Warren's wife. He had a profound influence on Rick, Kay says. We were captivated by his positive appeal to non-believers. I never look back. His positive appeal to non-believers is not to tell them that they're sinners. Remember what he said? Don't tell them of their lost and sinful condition. Sounds like he had no influence on Rick Warren, doesn't it? He had a profound influence on Rick. Now, there's a number of occasions in the purpose-driven life when Rick Warren uses terms and phrases which Robert Schuller has previously used. A very similar teaching. We don't have time to look at them all. We're going to look at one. In his 1997 book, If It's Going to Be, It's Up to Me, Schuller said, start with your heart. Listen to the call of your heart of hearts. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm your heart, your passionate power. 2002, five years later in The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren outlines a program, what he calls his SHAPE program. And the H in that program stands for your heart. And Warren says, listening to your heart. Listen to your heart. Another word for your heart is passion. Back to Schuller, passion is the key to success. Every achiever I've met is quick to admit that the passion for his or her dream made it happen. Great emphasis is placed on listening to the heart. What does God's word say about the heart? Matthew 15, verses 18 and 19, the Lord Jesus Christ says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And Rick Warren tells us to listen to our hearts. Robert Schuller tells you, listen to your heart. God says the heart is deceitful. It's deceitful. That's just one example of Rick Warren following in the footsteps of the father figure of possibility thinking. So we've had the father figure in this dysfunctional family. Let's move on to the next character. Mother Teresa, a Roman Catholic nun widely recognized for her charity work in India and many other countries. But the reality is about Mother Teresa, based upon her own words, is that she was a universalist. And what I mean by universalist is that she believes every religion leads to God and everyone will make their own way to God. She's quoted in a book about her life called A Simple Path as saying, all is God. Buddhists, Hindus, Christians, etc., all have access to the same God. She further said, I've always said we should help a Hindu become a better Hindu, a Muslim, a better Muslim, a Catholic, a better Catholic. She's on the track, the fast track to sainthood within the Roman Catholic religion, a religion which does not accept the sacrifice of Christ as a once never to be repeated sacrifice. Let's not make any mistakes about this here. The Roman Catholic Church believes that the process of the Mass sees the wafer transformed into the actual body of Christ, sees the wine transformed into the actual blood of Christ. It's a process called transubstantiation. It's a perpetual, a continuing sacrifice every time that the Mass is taken. God's Word tells us in Hebrews 10 and verse 12, but this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. What links Rick Warren to this woman, Mother Teresa? Well, for a start, he quotes her twice in the book, page 125 and page 231. But you know, he quotes her, okay. But on August the 26th, 2010, Rick Warren tweeted this message. It, it always seems strange to say that somebody tweeted from a pulpit. Rick Warren tweeted, Today, Mother Teresa was born 100 years ago. Time, the Time magazine, has a book on her great life, and I wrote the foreword. Rick Warren wrote the foreword. I have a copy of it with me tonight. And there's lots of things in it. In that, book, in that foreword, Rick Warren gushes praise about Mother Teresa and the influence that she had upon both him and his wife. 
And he said, amongst other things, by being the hands and feet of Jesus, this petite Albanian Catholic nun became one of the great evangelists of the 20th century. He goes on to say to the readers about Mother Teresa, he says, discover her motivation, discover her method, but most of all, her master. Rick Warren, with those words, includes Mother Teresa as a Christian. He's including her as a Christian, and yet the false religion that she professed, including her own elevation of Mary to the position of co-mediator alongside Jesus Christ with God as co-redemptrix, has led billions upon billions of souls astray. Which is it, Rick? Is she or is she not? We've had the father figure with Mother Teresa. What about Rick Warren's Islamic brother? Rick Warren when answering a question at an event held on the 24th of January 2011. It was an event held by the World Economic Forum on Faith and Modernization. Rick Warren was on the question panel, or on the panel, and he was asked a question, and this was his answer to the question. To my Islamic brother here from Italy. Islamic brother here from Italy. I'm not really interested in interfaith dialogue. I'm interested in interfaith projects We've got enough talk. So two weeks ago, a few weeks ago, this is a direct quote, a few weeks ago at Georgetown University, we brought in three imams, three Catholic priests, three evangelical pastors and three rabbis to see what we can do about AIDS. And we started on some common ground on those issues. What can we do that we all care about? His Islamic brother? I thought he was an evangelical Christian. His Islamic brother? No more interfaith dialogue? Let's have interfaith projects? In Matthew chapter 7, during the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. <coughs> wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leadeth to destruction. And this wide road, with all of these different false religions on it, that Rick Warren is having this interaction with, this wide road, People are breezing, John MacArthur says, people are breezing through those wide, comfortable, inviting gates with all their baggage, their self-needs, their self-esteem, and the desire for fulfillment and self-satisfaction. And the most horrible thing about it is they think they're going to heaven. Sheep's and wolves' clothing. Final point, and very, very quickly, distinct, there's a distinct New Age flavor. What do I mean by New Age? Well, there's a couple of definitions. I don't want to go into it in any detail because I don't have time, but the New Age movement could be described in a number of ways. It could be described as a man-centric collection of religious thoughts and systems. Warren Smith, who, who we've referred to any, earlier, was saved out of the New Age movement. One of the things that he was involved in in the New Age movement was a course in miracles, and he describes it as a New Age tool. In that program, it states, I am affected only by my thoughts. It needs but this to let salvation come to all the world. For in this single thought is everyone released at last from fear. You'll recall that we mentioned the New Age mantra from the message, as above, so below. You'll also recall that Rick Warren had referred to Dr. Bernie Siegel, who is a New Age advocate in his book. We're going to look at one other New Age advocate, Neil Donald Walsh, author of a series of books called Conversations with God. Neil Donald Walsh wrote that Dr. Bernie Siegel was the first celebrity endorsement he received for Conversations with God, book one. And in that series, Walsh defines the new gospel, stating that God told him, and listen to this, you are the creator and the created. You are already a God. You simply do not know it. There is only one of us. You and I are one. Walsh was also invited to contribute to a 2002 book entitled From the Ashes, a spiritual response to the attack on America. Rick Warren also contributed to that book. This is what Walsh said. 
We must preach a new gospel. It's healing message summarized in two sentences. We are all one. Ours is not a better way. Ours is merely another way. Neil Donald Walsh, promoting the doctrine of oneness, the teaching of oneness, thanks Bernie Siegel for his support. Bernie Siegel promotes New Age beliefs with his demon guy, George, and Rick Warren, in this book, introduces every one of the more than 30 million readers of his book to Bernie Siegel as a positive promoter of hope. Oneness. Page 88 of the Purpose Driven Life. The New Century Version, Ephesians 4, verse 6. Rick Warren quotes it. He rules everything and is everywhere and is in everything. In this verse, Paul is speaking specifically to the believers in the church at Ephesus. And he's instructing them to walk worthy of their master. He's telling them that they, as believers, are indwelt with the Spirit of God. The verse should read, One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. The you being the Ephesian believers. But the rendering by Warren of the New Century Version promotes this New Age view that God is in everything. Bernie Siegel said in Prescriptions for Living that God is in everyone and everything. Robert Schuller said, yes, God is alive and he's in every single human being. Rick Warren quotes this verse, he rules everything and is everywhere and is in everything. Galatians 5 and verse 9 says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Warren is introducing New Age teachers to people across the world. And he's using deficient paraphrases and translations of God's Word to argue his point. And they are muddying the waters. Let me say very clearly tonight to each and every one of you, we are not one with everyone and everything. We are not. Galatians 3, verse 26 to 28, God's Word says, For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's the clause, and that's the important bit. By faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. One more character. Ron Wolfson, co-president of Synagogue 3000. Wolfson wrote a book, God's To-Do List. 103 Ways to Be an Angel and Do God's Work. In the book, Wolfson wrote, you are God's partner. God needs you to continue the ongoing creation of the world. He then quotes Genesis 1 and 27, and he asks the question, wait a minute, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? And then he makes a statement. It means that the spark of divinity is within you. Same thoughts coming up over and over and over again. Wolfson's, Wolfson's from a Jewish background. It's coming up over and over and over again. And it's essentially saying that we're all little gods. We're all little gods. That's what it's saying. And Rick, why did I quote Wilson? Because Rick Warren endorsed that book. And his endorsement states, this book is built on a great premise. Figure out what God does and then do that with other people. Simple but profound. I loved this book. Young people, in conclusion, very quickly, don't be deceived by the Rick Warrens of this world. In Acts 20 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul warned the overseers of the church at Ephesus to take heed unto themselves and unto all the flock. And why did he warn them to do this? Why did he warn them to take heed? Well, he did that because in verses 29 and 30, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Galatians 1, verses 6 to 9. The verses we started with, Paul warned the believers at Galatia. Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5. Christ speaking about a time which is now imminent. This was the occasion when Christ was asked, what shall the signs be about about the end of the world? This is a, a passage about the end times. And Christ says, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. These New Age messengers that Warren is promoting and quoting 
are saying that we're all gods. And when they're saying that we're all gods, they're saying that they're God. They're saying that they are God too because they're saying that we're all God. That's what Robert Schuller has said. They've all said that. In 2004, Robert Schuller said, and there's Rick Warren, a pastor who today is phenomenal. He came to our institute time after time. Rick Warren said he wasn't influenced or mentored in any way by Robert Schuller. Robert Schuller says he came to our institute time after time. Folks, we need to be careful of what we believe. We need to go back to that Berean attitude. We need to adopt the Berean attitude from Acts 17 and verse 11. Don't depend upon books just because they're popular, just because they have a label of being a Christian book. Don't depend upon books. Depend upon God's Word, the Bible. John 17 and 17, the Lord Jesus Christ in His great prayer to His Father said, Sanctify them through Thy Word. Thy Word is Sanctify them through thy word. You want to live a purpose-driven life? You want to live a life with real purpose? Get into God's word and find out what God's purpose is from him, from this living word. Know what you believe and learn it from God's word. Spend time in God's word. Don't be deceived by purpose-driven lies. Amen. Thanks, David. We'll just give thanks to the food. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy word to our hearts tonight. We thank thee for helping thy servant David as he brought this before us tonight, Lord. And we just pray that we would bear these things in mind as we seek to live lives that bring glory to thy name. We thank you now, Lord, for this food that's been provided. Bless it to our bodies and us in thy service. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <laughs>